thank you, thank you. I always say that whenever this happens, I'm not saying it happens all the time, but when it does happen, it's always like the biggest confidence booster. I haven't even said anything and you like me. <laughs> but so I wanted, every time when I speak, I kind of have something on the side that has like water, maybe a chair in case I get tired. But I was kind of nervous that this chair might be a little too big and take too much of the stage. So I hope it's not distracting <laughs> if it's too big. But I saw this chair earlier today and I was like, oh my goodness, it's Lizzie size. Like, I'm not even joking. I, I can fit perfectly <laughs> in this chair. But I wanted to go ahead and do a few disclaimers before I start speaking. Okay, the first one. I have two microphone packs on, and so if you see me pulling up my pants, I know that's not like, I don't know, nice or whatever, but my pants keep falling. And disclaimer number two, if I keep going like this, it's because I'm blind in this eye and I can't tell if my bangs are falling in front of my face, and I don't want to be talking to you like this. So I'm, if I do that, I know it's a really annoying habit and I'm working on it, but I forgot bobby pins because I was too excited to be here. Today has been an absolutely wonderful day. David has been showing us and introducing us to so many amazing people at Hope Ministries. And I, we got here yesterday. We flew here from Austin, Texas. And as soon as we got here, David greeted us with the biggest smile and said, Lizzie, I have two gifts for you. And right away, I was like, I love you already. <laughs> and let me just say, David, I hope you don't mind that I tell them about these gifts. But after opening these gifts, I was like, all right, I know God brought me here. David got me a shirt um, with cows on it that said <laughs> something about cow tipping. And I feel like since I'm from Texas, and that's kind of known from Texas, it's like, all right, we have a connection here. But the second thing he got me was absolutely my favorite thing, and I wish I would have brought it to show you guys, but he brought me a coffee cup that's a cow, and the thing that holds it up are the udders. <laughs> I told him it was utterly amazing. <laughs> but. Anyway, okay, that's it. I'll go ahead and get started telling you my story now. What you saw in the video um, was basically my story. And I just want to let you know that that video was filmed about four years ago. I just turned 24 this year. And I wanted to let you know something about that video because in the video, we filmed it and I had a cast on my leg. And previously before that, I had a boot on my leg. And then at the end of the video, the person that narrated says she's not fragile. And when I watched it, I was like, oh, but I'm in a cast. But let me just explain, I'm not fragile. My bones are actually really, really strong. The reason that I was in a boot and a cast is because when I was at college, I walked everywhere. And at my campus, it was just full of hills and stairs and ugh, a mess. But I walked a ton. And instead of wearing supportive shoes that support my feet, where I have no fat on the bottom of my foot, I wore cute shoes that matched my outfit and weren't supportive. And clearly, I haven't learned my lesson. But I, my mom gets out of me every time. But I can't wear sneakers if they don't match my outfit. And since I have really tiny legs, they make me look like I have dinosaur feet. So I just don't wear them. But I, like I said, I am pretty healthy for the most part. Even though I'm so small, I have a very weak immune system. So if I get a cold, it can bring me down for about two weeks and then the cold can turn into bad asthma and the asthma can turn into something else and so it's usually just kind of a drawn out process. But the only main things that we know about my syndrome right now is that I can't gain weight. I've never probably weighed over 64 pounds my whole life and let me tell you when I hit that 64 pounds, I made sure everybody knew because every pound counts. I was born two pounds, 10 ounces, and I was probably this small. If you put your hands like this, you can tell how small that is. And I personally don't remember, but that's what my parents told me. <laughs> and they did have to go to Toys R Us to buy me doll clothes. And I guess it kind of saved my parents money because I ended up playing with those clothes um, with my actual dolls when I grew out of them. So kind of killed two birds with one stone. But I was very tiny. and. I do, I always want to make sure people know this. 
I do eat, and I eat a lot. <laughs> I have to snack a lot throughout the day to keep my energy up. And I'm pretty sure most people have that same problem if you get really hungry and you get tired and then you get grouchy. That's me, but like times 30. And my friends always know, like if I'm snappy with them, I'm either tired, annoyed, or hungry. <laughs> but other than that, my appetite is, I think the best way to describe my appetite is one of a five-year-old. I can live off of McDonald's, Taco Bell, um, pretty much every junk food I like. Um, we were back there uh, and we were waiting and I looked at the table and it had a fruit tray, a vegetable tray, and then my KFC that I brought. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty normal. But I, I eat a lot of small portions throughout the day because if I eat a big portion, um, I get really full really fast. And last night we went to eat at Outback and for the first time I decided to branch out and be adult-ish from the kid menu and I ordered grilled chicken and I was so proud I made my mom take a picture of me and I ate it all and it was so good. But um, yeah, the other thing with my syndrome besides the whole weight gaining thing is I am blind out of my right eye. I don't ever remember what it was like to see out of two eyes. In my mind, it's so hard for me to understand how you can see out of two eyes because I feel like you just see way too much at one time. And I really have these conversations with my friends and I'm like, just explain it to me. I just can't comprehend. And I'm like, it's easy for you to see how I see. You just cover your eye. That's it. But since I've kind of grown up with this, I've kind of learned the benefits of being visually impaired. And you're probably thinking benefits. What's good about only seeing out of one eye? Well, let me tell you. I wear a contact, not contact which means half price contacts. <laughs> I have to wear reading glasses, lens I need on this eye, clear lids on this one. And this one is my personal favorite. If my friends are kind of annoying me and kind of making me mad or just annoyed, I casually have them stand on this side of me. <laughs> it's like they're not even there. Like I can't see anything over here. I actually did a speech on that uh, for one of my college classes, and I got an A. <laughs> but um, yeah, so growing up, I had a completely normal childhood, completely normal. So normal to the point that when I started kindergarten, I had no clue that I was different. I couldn't physically see that I looked different from the other kids. My parents raised me completely normally, despite being having their first child be so kind of not different but just have this unknown syndrome and not really know why she looked like this or why she was so small and like i said my parents treated me normally the people around us treated me normally so i had my friends growing up everything was normal and so when it was time to start kindergarten i remember and you guys probably know this feeling whenever it's the night before the first day of school and you have like everything picked out and you're like really anxious and nervous because you don't know who's going to be in your class, how it's going to be. And I remember I was the exact same way for kindergarten. I remember I picked out like my Pocahontas matching backpack, um, my Pocahontas um, lunchbox. I had a matching bow and I had ruffle socks and I was ready to go. I was so excited. And since I was so small, my backpack was like way, like turtle shell around me. But I thought I was so cool and ready and five years old, you know, funny little kid. My mom was saying yesterday that I, um, my voice when I was little was like a Minnie Mouse, really squeaky. I feel like that would kind of get annoying after a while. But um, I started school and the first day, I kind of think of the whole elementary school years as a big slap of reality for a five-year-old. And it sounds kind of harsh. But when I started school on the first day, I saw a little girl sitting down reading a book. I walk up to her and I smile at her and she looks up at me like I was a monster from a movie. And my first reaction was, okay, <laughs> she's rude. I'm a fun kid, what is she thinking, whatever. So I just remember letting it go, not really thinking anything of it. 
And the entire day was like that times 20. Not one person wanted to sit by me. Not one person wanted to um, talk to me. Lunch, nobody wanted to sit by me. I remember getting ready for recess, and of course everyone's super excited for recess. I mean, come on, who doesn't like recess? And I remember with my little tiny body running out to the playground, and I remember climbing all the way up to the playground, ready to go down the slide, and there was a long line to the slide. And as soon as I got there, everyone moved. And you would think, like, VIP to the slide, they're all moving. <laughs> They were moving because they were scared of me, and they didn't know how to react around me. I got called ugly, I, called, I got called skinny bones, I got called grandma, pork chop legs, all kinds of things, but I think one of the things that hurt the most wasn't the name calling, but it was the stares. And it was when people, when I would walk down the hall and people would tap the person on their shoulder and I could see them point at me, and people would kind of whisper about me. And at such a young age, again, I couldn't understand why. Why were they doing this? And I remember going home and asking my parents, what's wrong with me? Because again, I couldn't see that I was different. And so that's when my parents had to sit me down and explain to me that I did have the syndrome. But I credit this to, I credit this one thing that they did to most of my life and how I've lived out my life because from the day that they explained it to me, they never had anything negative to say. They never said, Lizzie, you have this syndrome, you can't do this. Lizzie, you have this syndrome, you'll never be able to do this. Lizzie, because you're blind in one eye or you're too small or whatever it may be, you won't be able to do this in life, never. The one thing that they told me was that I was a little bit smaller but I was just like everybody else. And they encouraged me when I went back to school to continue to just be myself. And eventually others would see that. And so that's what I did. I went back to school and of course I did, have, I did still have people kind of making fun of me and staring at me, but over time the kids in my class were used to me. And they started realizing that that's just Lizzie, she's just like us. And so over time, those friends that I made at school kind of started becoming like my bodyguards, but in a good way. Whenever somebody would pick on me or come up and say something to me, or they would see someone talking about me, they would go up to them and say, you know, that's, that's not nice, that's Lizzie, that's our friend. And luckily, I never had to deal with any physical bullying ever. I only had to deal with the verbal bullying and the being not pushed. I just said I wasn't physically bullied. Um, kind of just kids picking at me and stuff, but a little story that I always love to share is when I was in elementary school, like I told you, I have to snack a lot throughout the day. So I was allowed to have whatever I wanted in my desk. And I had, I didn't even hold back. I had like donuts, Skittles, Rice Krispie Treats, cookies, whatever I wanted. I took full advantage of this opportunity. And so no matter what we were doing, I could eat. And if you were my friends, and even if you didn't sit by me, which I probably sure was like really obvious, but I would sneak food to my friends. <laughs> but if you were still a bully to me, you didn't get anything. They just got to watch. And that was my little, mm-hmm. Should have been nice to me. <laughs> but don't be nice to me tomorrow, because I know why you're doing it. <laughs> but throughout elementary school, I did have to kind of deal with things like that, but as I was getting older, I started becoming more aware of my syndrome. And you guys know what it's like as you get older and you kind of start caring a little bit more about your appearance, what you look like, what the cool kids are wearing, that kind of thing, and that's exactly what I went through, exact same thing. I remember when we would be um, having like a big assembly and everyone was sitting down um, watching whatever was going on. And I remember watching certain girls and thinking, oh, I wish I could wear that. I wish I could wear that. But I couldn't because I still had to wear little tiny clothes that fit me, which I'm not gonna lie, I'm at 24 and I still shop at Children's Place. And another little thing, the shoes I'm wearing right now are Velcro, but I make them look cool. <laughs> Another benefit, <laughs> children's price closed 
as an adult. Yes. <laughs> but again, as I got older, I was becoming more aware of my syndrome, and I didn't like it. I didn't like what I was realizing. I didn't like what I saw in the mirror. And yes, I was still being called names as I got older, and I'm a very non-confrontational person. I avoided at all costs possible. And so whenever someone would tell me something, I would either just walk away or just never show any emotion. I never want anyone to see that I was sad, that I was being picked on. And so the way I dealt with it was when I would go home at night, I would go take my bath at night and I knew nobody would walk in. I knew no one would walk in and catch me crying and say, Lizzie, why are you crying? What's wrong? Or my dad especially, because at the time, my dad was a teacher at my school. And so I knew if I told him somebody was picking on me, he could easily walk down the hallway and go into my class and say, why are you picking on your daughter? And then that not only makes me the girl who looks different, but the girl who's a tattletale who has her dad come and you know, get after other people who are being mean to her. So I just avoided it. But I would cry at night. And like I said in the video, I really did go to sleep every single night, say my prayers, and say, God, please, please. When I wake up in the morning and I go brush my teeth and I look in the mirror, change me. Change me completely. Make me look like the popular girls. Make me look like a supermodel. Because in my mind, if I looked like everybody else, all my problems would go away. I wouldn't have to deal with people staring at me. I wouldn't have to deal with people calling me names. I would be able to go to theme parks and not feel miserable and want to leave because people are walking past me and stopping and looking me up and down. I would be able to go to swim at a public swimming pool with my friends and not feel ashamed of my body because people were staring at me or kids were being mean. For many years, I repeated this process over and over because I didn't know who to blame. I kind of transitioned into a phase of being just really angry, really angry. And I'd say this was probably about the time that I was in middle school. We all know what middle school is like. I was really excited to be older and starting a new school, but at the same time, still struggling with my self-image and liking myself. And when I was in middle school, I had a big group of friends, my best friends, who I'm still close with today. And they always supported me. I could cry with them. They would make me laugh. It was so great. But personally, I wasn't happy with what I saw in the mirror. And again, I didn't know who to blame. I couldn't blame my friends. They had nothing to do with this. I couldn't blame my parents because I knew they didn't choose to have a girl with this unknown syndrome. I couldn't blame my doctors because they didn't even know what was going on with me. The only person I knew to blame was God. And I grew up in the church with my family. We were very involved ever since I was in kindergarten. And people knew my family, they knew us, and everyone was still super nice to us. Our extended family was all very religious and always really encouraging. But personally, me and God weren't getting along. Because God wasn't answering my prayers to magically change me and make me look like everybody else. And so I kind of think of that time in my life as my Jan Brady phase. Because I wished I could just scrub the syndrome off my face and make it go away. But nothing was working. Parts of my life were still really great. My family was amazing. My sister was born. She was actually born when I was in elementary school, and I took her to show and tell. It was a really <laughs> random story, but I just remembered that. But my sister was born, and my brother was born. My family was amazing. But I couldn't figure out, why can't I be happy with myself? And it wasn't until right before eighth grade. And I remember specifically being in the back seat with my mom driving home from the school, randomly got this idea in my head and I said, Mom, I'm going to try out for cheerleading next week. 
And I looked at my mom in the mirror, and it looked like her eyes were going to pop out of her head. And I know I look so super athletic, but it's the first thing, the first athletic thing I'd ever done in my life. I was always exempt from PE. And my mom, was, she paused, and she said, really? And I said, yeah, I want to wear the uniform. It's really cute. And then I kept talking to her more, and I was like, you know, now that I think about it, I really don't want to cheer, really don't want to have to run. I just kind of want to wear the uniform. And so I tried out, I made it, and now I realize that whoever tried out made it, but I made it, and <laughs> being able to put on that uniform, which now I, like, I look back at the pictures and the skirts were like past my knees, but I just remember being so super excited because wearing that uniform made me feel like I was like the cool kids. It was kind of like my costume of confidence. Whenever I wore it, I felt like the underclassmen were like, oh, she's a cheerleader. She's a little cheerleader, but she's a cheerleader. <laughs> and I remember when I first started practicing with some of the girls, I was like, I want to be the flyer. I want to be the one that you throw all the way up in the air. And when I said that, you could hear a pin drop. No one knew what to say. They were all really hesitant. And I was like, look, let's just try this. If I fall, I'll get up and do it again. I promise. The only way for you to believe me is if we try it. And we tried it, and you should have seen how high I could go. <laughs> Whenever you go on a roller coaster and you like have that feeling in your stomach, that's what I would get because I was going so high. And I remember my parents were at every single game, always cheering and excited, and my mom would record everything. And whenever we would do stunts, the camera was like shaking. And all I could hear say, her, like all you could hear, you can see me, but all you can hear is, don't drop her, don't drop her, don't drop her, don't drop her. And I remember one time she recorded me falling, and you could see me just get up and start laughing. But I wanted to show them, I'm just like you, I'm fine. And so we did it, and I absolutely loved it. And ever since, like, once I started cheering and making friends, I started realizing that I like being around people. I'm a people person. I like trying new things. I never thought that I could do something like this, and I just one day decided to do it. And it was probably one of the best things I could have chosen to, done because, chosen to do, because after I did it, I decided to join absolutely everything that I could. I did cheerleading, I wrote for our school newspaper, I took pictures for our school yearbook, I joined theater, I hated acting. I was in one play and I won an award. <laughs> I, the role that I had to play was, it was a play within a play, and I was the person that read the script in the play, so I had the script in my hand, so I, just, I literally sat there and just read from the script. No one knew that and I got an award. But doing all these things just helped boost my confidence. And yes, be, just because I was doing that didn't mean all the staring in public stopped. It didn't make me automatically love who I was. I still had this struggle of comparing myself to other people in school. After this, after I like, ended middle school and I started high school, before I started high school, I pictured it being like the movies. I pictured walking in and the doors open and then your hair is like blowing in the wind. And then you walk in and you think you're so cool. And then you see like groups of football players and band people and whatever it is, that's what I pictured. And I walked in and it was nothing like that. <laughs> but I started ninth grade with more confidence in who I was. I was kind of starting to like who I was I had really amazing friends, my family was amazing, everyone was super supportive. And I started high school and I decided, why not try out for cheerleading again? And I did it, and I didn't realize high school cheerleading takes a lot more work than middle school cheerleading. And I'm going to admit that I pulled the help me I'm little card and whenever we had to run track for the first time I saw a high school track, it was so big. And I was like, um, I don't think I can run. I'll just do push-ups, right? Or not push-ups, what are they called? Sit-ups. I'll do sit-ups right here. 
And so I would just lay there and pretend that I was doing them. And when everyone was done running, they'd be out of breath. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so tired. And I really didn't do anything. But again, I had to show them that I was just like them. And after I did that, and I started kind of liking myself, kind of thinking, you know, I'm pretty fun, pretty great. But I still kept thinking, why do I have this syndrome? Why did God give me this syndrome? I became more involved at our church when I was in high school. I taught um, second grade Sunday school with one of my best friends and I loved it. It was kind of hard at first because when little kids see me, they don't really know how to react. And they're kind of nervous and so I remember the first day I, we kind of played a little game with them and they got used to me and eventually I was just Miss Lizzie to them and I loved being at church when I was in high school I would sometimes realize that I was there Friday Saturday and Sunday and I had my church friends and I had my school friends and watching you guys some of you that came up here earlier it made me smile because I remember when I was in your exact same shoes. And what made me smile the most is there were some people who were up here who were really getting into it and singing and dancing, but then it was kind of like their friends that made them come up with them. And they're kind of just standing there like this. And some will kind of like check their phone and put it up. And I remember that's exactly what my friends and I did. And it wasn't until a few years into high school that one person started kind of getting into it it brought the other person into it and eventually all of us were just worshiping and singing and being so happy but I still had this little conflict with God even though things were kind of getting better I still had this little conflict with him because I still didn't know my purpose I still didn't know why God made me so small I didn't know why he only gave me vision out of one eye I didn't understand why he got me so sick and why I would have to miss school a lot of times and during all of this I kind of got really dark I I wasn't sure why all this was happening to me and my personality kind of changed instead of being the per people person that I was I kind of just stayed to myself my blinds were always down in my room. My family noticed it and my friends noticed it. And they would come over after school and they would turn music on and sing and dance with me. And my mom would go in my room and open the blinds and say, you need to snap out of this. But again, I couldn't do it. But once I started high school, I was honestly feeling a lot better about myself, feeling pretty confident in myself. And I remember towards the end of my freshman year, a lot of people started saying, Lizzie, I saw you on TV. I remember seeing you. And I remembered when I was 11 years old, I was on a television show telling my story about who I am and that kind of thing. But it was so long ago. And I kept thinking, where'd you see it? I want to see you, show me. And every time I would ask them to show me, they would change the subject and they would just let it go and again I just thought all right whatever I was there I saw it already but one day I was at home and I was procrastinating doing homework and you guys know exactly what that's like because I still well I did it all the time and at the time I was sitting at home and I wanted to listen to music on YouTube and you guys know whenever you look on YouTube and then there's like a right hand column of like related videos well that's what I saw and when I looked a little bit closer I realized that there was a picture that looked really really familiar on the related column so I clicked on it not knowing that me clicking on this little picture that I thought was me would change my life completely I didn't know it would be a defining moment in my life when I clicked on that video. What's the video? I clicked on it. The first thing I saw was, okay, yes, that is my picture. 
from when I was 11 years old when I was on that show. I looked a little bit above this video and the title of this video was The World's Ugliest Woman. I want you to take a second and let that sink in. Think how that would feel if you are randomly just listening to music, you somehow see a picture of yourself and someone la labels you the world's ugliest man or the world's ugliest woman. Just think how that would make you feel. Now, picture yourself scrolling down after seeing this awful, awful video. And picture how you would feel if you looked down and you saw that over four million people had saw this video. Four million. I continued to scroll down and I saw that this video was eight seconds long. I pressed play and there was no sound. And I thought, there's an eight second video with no sound that over four million people saw of only me calling me the world's ugliest woman. I literally felt like somebody was putting their hand through the computer and punching me over and over and over. I still to this day don't know why I did this, but I scrolled down and I saw that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of comments on this eight second video that had no sound. I sat there and I read every single one and not one was positive, not one. These comments ranged from people telling me to do the world a favor and just put a gun to my head. Some were saying, why don't you just walk out of your house with a bag over your head? Because if people see your face, they're going to go blind from your ugliness. People were giving me tips on how to kill myself. I was in high school when I saw this. The video clip was from when I was 11 years old, and it said it. Clear as day on this video, it said 11 years old. And I couldn't understand how anyone, no matter what age, could think how to just jump on this bandwagon and say these awful, awful things, not knowing that I would one day somehow stumble upon it. I cried my eyes out reading these comments. My confidence level went from being up here to being way down here to almost not even existent. And I feel like it took me a really long time to get to that point. In an instant, it was brought down completely. My tears quickly turned to anger. I quickly wanted to just wipe the tears off my face pull out the keyboard and reply back to every single comment. I didn't know what I was going to tell them, but I just wanted to make them feel bad. I wanted to make them feel bad for hiding behind their computer screen and saying these awful things about someone that they don't even know. But then I stopped and I realized, what am I going to accomplish? What am I going to do if I sink down to their level? Nothing. I'm going to be fighting a never-ending battle that's going to prove nothing. I'm just going to become one of those people that hides behind their computer screen and makes fun of other people or makes other people feel bad about themselves. And that's not who I was raised to be. So I stopped and I had a very hard time swallowing this video. A very hard time, I'm not going to lie. But something clicked in me, some little voice in the back of my head, which I know is God. And I heard, just wait, let it go. Just let it go and wait. And that's what I did. I let it go, and yes, it was very hard for me to kind of pick myself up from that. 
very difficult. But I did what my parents told me when I was in kindergarten. They said, just continue to be yourself and others will see that. So that's what I did. I continued high school. Everything was wonderful despite this video. When I was in high school, I knew I wanted to go to college to major in computer engineering because I've always loved computers. My sophomore year of high school, one of the assistant principals towards the end of the year said, Lizzie, we have a group of 400 freshmen who we need somebody to kind of give them a, an assembly. Would you do it and tell your story? And I immediately started laughing and said, no way. There's no way I would do that. And she said, all right, I want you to go home, talk to your parents, talk to your friends, and get back to me. So that's what I did. My parents thought it was a great idea. My friends thought it was an even greater idea because they made posters. They even brought a video camera and they all sat in the front row. They were my little fan club. And the night before the speech, I remember sitting down and writing my entire speech word for word, thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? Why did I agree to this? The next day, went up on stage. I had a bigger chair than this and a little table. And I sat down in the half of the speech, I was like this, looking down the entire time, reading from my paper. Eventually, I put the paper down, looked up, and just started speaking. You could hear a pin drop in the room the entire time I was speaking. By the time I was done, people were coming up to me and crying with tears in their eyes, saying, thank you. And I thought, thank you. Thank you for not being boring. Like, what are they thanking me for? And they were telling me, thank you. You made me realize that there are other people who have these insecurities, other people who were bullied. And immediately I realized, even though not one person in that room has the syndrome that I have, they could somehow relate to what I went through. And that made me feel good. That made me feel really confident. One of my favorite things is there was these really, really tough guys. That's my tough guy impression. <laughs> really, really tough guys. And they came up to me and they had their hats down. And I was like, I can't even see you. And then I realized they had their hats down because they were crying. They were in tears. And they hugged me. And they, again, said, thank you. You inspired me that things will get better. And in that moment, in that moment, I had never felt more proud to be the girl that God had made me than in that moment. And I knew right away, this is going to be my purpose in life, is to be a motivational speaker, which I didn't even know was a job, <laughs> which I was really excited when I found out it was an actual job, and I was like, great! I know what I want to do with my life. So I kind of just started wanting to tell people my story. I was talking to anyone who would listen to me. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to be a motivational speaker. I look back now and I realize if there was three people, I was like, all right, sit down. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> After that, I decided I was going to set four goals for myself when I was getting ready for college. I decided I wanted to be a motivational speaker, I wanted to publish a book, I wanted to graduate college, and I want to have my own family and my own career. Those are my goals, that's what I was going to work towards. I was accepted to Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas, which is about 15-20 minutes away from Austin where my family lives. And you would think, oh, Lizzie, you were probably so nervous to move away from home. No. I couldn't wait. I was so excited to move that my dad was like, look, I will pay you weekly if you want to go to school in Austin and live at home. And I was like, if you would offer me that any other time, I would say yes. But right now, I have to go pack. <laughs> and so I packed all my stuff, moved away from home. My parents were super excited. My mom set up my whole dorm room and I was like, Mom, all right, I can do it. 
and I did it. My first day of starting to be independent. I had to figure out ways if I couldn't see something, I found a magnifying app on my phone with the light. I don't care if people saw me. <laughs> if I can't see it, then I'm going to look even dumber. I was excited to meet new people. I was excited to start this new journey in my life. And without even trying, my life kind of started, everything kind of just started falling into place. My relationship with God was better than ever because in that moment when I realized that I wanted to be a speaker, I was like, God, I get you now. I get it. I'm st I still have some questions, but I get it. You made me the girl that I am for a reason. You gave me all those struggles growing up to make me stronger. You made me look different so that I could see the beauty that isn't defined by the media. And yes, I am still learning. So like I said, I set these goals for myself. Little by little, I kept working on each thing. It always makes me so happy when I get to share this. This year will be my eighth year of motivational speaking. I've been, thank you, I've been blessed to be able to travel and have opportunities to tell my story and to show other people that no matter what you look like, if you are doubted from day one, you can still probably do even better what you thought you could do. It's incredible. I can't even tell you. Doing the speaking stuff when I'm done, I'm like, oh, that was awesome. That was so fun. And I don't even know like, if I did good or whatever. I just know I had fun. <laughs> but the feeling that I get, that I know that God is working through me and helping me tell you something is the greatest feeling in the entire world. So my first goal, checked off. Well, still continuing, <laughs> clearly. My second goal was to publish a book. I've always loved writing, always. And I knew I wanted to write a book, but I never thought I'd be like Harry Potter level, Twilight level. I didn't even know what I wanted to write a book about. My freshman year of college, I was given the opportunity to write my first book. A year later, I published my first book, Lizzie Beautiful, in English and in Spanish. To hold that book in my hands for the first time was the coolest thing ever. The first time I heard someone say, oh yeah, you're a motivational speaker and an author, I was like, whoa, I really am. That's kind of cool. Let me make a website about it. <laughs> about a year, a year and a half after Lizzie Beautiful came out, I thought, wow, like, this is so great and just so honored that I had this opportunity. And then I got a phone call from a publishing house in St. Louis, and they said, Lizzie, we love your story. We want to hire you as the youngest author we've ever hired in our publishing house. It's like, all right, no pressure. OK. Join the team. A year later, I published my second book, Be Beautiful, Be You. My first book I wrote along with my mom, and it basically just tells the story of who I am and what I went through on my good days and my bad days, and my mom shares what it was like raising me and how I was a perfect little angel. <laughs> I wrote the second half of when I was in high school and growing up, and Be Beautiful, Be You, I wrote on my own. That book was my baby. I poured my heart and my soul into this book. And this book, it's an advice book. Each chapter is something different. I give you advice on self-esteem, learning how to find and keep good friends, learning how to forgive others. One of the coolest things about this book is that you can write in it. You can write your goals. You can write the things that you love about yourself. I am so, so proud of that book. Want to know something kind of cool? Last week, I had my first official meeting for book three. <laughs> the, 
during the process of writing Be Beautiful Be You, a lot of the big people at the publishing house had a lot of doubts in me. And I was, I knew like, I was going to make them proud. A couple weeks after the second book came out, it was number two on Amazon and number six on iTunes. I was so excited. Last week during our meeting, they said, all right, <laughs> we put this book in your hands. <laughs> we trust you. <laughs> so to think that I just had this small little goal to write a book, to realizing that I'm going to be starting my third one? What is going on? <laughs> goal two checked off. Goal three was to graduate college. This past December, I finished my undergrad career. <laughs> I'll be getting my degree in communication studies from Texas State University. I can't even tell you how excited I am. <laughs> My major is communication studies and it has a focus on public speaking and my minor is English. And while I was working on my degree, I was still motivational speaking and my books were coming out and I would go to class and I was like, does real life experience count? Can I just, you know, can I just not take that math test? And unfortunately it didn't work that way. But I, my plan right now is to take a year off and then go back to school to get my master's. Goal three? checked off. Goal four is to have my own family and my own career. My career part, I've got a good start on it. My family part is down the line. Earlier today we were talking about me getting married and my dad was already like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but all these things were something that I cannot take credit for on my own. I cannot. The only way that I was able to accomplish all of those things and will be able to continue for the rest of my life is with my faith, my family, and my friends. My faith is number one in my life. Amen. Number one. I look back now at all the years growing up and kind of my faith journey going from being kind of really rough to kind of getting better to kind of being rough again. And I look back now and I think that God gave me this syndrome before I looked at it as a giant flashing sign that said curse. I look now at what God gave me on this billboard and I see a giant bright happy sign that says blessing. And I will always look at it as a blessing. All the questions that I had, all the whys, all the why me, why God did you do this to me, have all been answered. And I've learned to stop asking why. Because I've learned that God does absolutely everything for a reason. And you have to basically just lay it all down and let God take care of it. Because he will, whether you see it or whether you don't. You will eventually be so surprised and think, thank you, God. Before you have this problem, he already knows how he's going to help you get through it. How great of a feeling is that? Whenever I do things, I get excited because I know that God is going to be there to help me. God is going to be there to pick me up when I'm down and to lift me even higher when I'm excited. If you are going through something where you think, why God? If you're in that phase that I've been there before, if you're in that phase of, why God can I lose weight? Why God isn't, why can I have blonde hair or brown hair or curly hair or straight hair? Why can't I be on the varsity football team? All these whys, I will tell you right now that if you stop asking why and if you start saying thank you, 
God, all your answers will come to you. All of them. God has not only helped me throughout my life, but he's blessed me with the absolutely most amazing family. You said hi to my parents earlier. My brother and sister had to stay home from school. My sister is 18 years old, and she will be starting at Texas State University in the fall. My brother is a freshman in high school, and he is the funniest kid in the entire world. But not only my immediate family, but now my extended family. It's going to be not only in my prayers, but I know it's going to be there cheering me on if another mad video or if something else happens. I want to thank you for having me, for listening to my message, and I hope, I hope that some of you know that God put you here for a reason, and he wants you to share that reason no matter what. Thank you. <laughs>